Welcome back, everybody. We had our second session of Fantasy Age Regenesis, and where we left the players off, we left the players inside a mine. They had battened down the hatches and locked themselves up for a night of rest out in the Barrens, and then they wanted to get back to Greenville the next day, mm -hmm. which by and large went pretty well. Uh, we did a lot more sort of world building, setting building, I think, in that, because I I spent a lot of time describing the terrain, mm. describing that you guys could see off to the east the Barrier Mountains, uh, because I knew the next adventure was going to involve the Barrier Mountains, so I wanted to start dropping foreshadowing for that. Uh, we only had one big event, which is when Josh's character, the lieutenant, slipped into a well, what looked like a quicksand. Mm -hmm. It was actually the pit for these little worms that worm their way in and start trying to eat away at your body. They catch animals that way, and when the animal drowns in the pit, they uh, they just start go to town on the corpse, mm -hmm. uh, which he didn't care for. He didn't like that at all. Well, it, was um, a, it was an interesting moment of conflict as we're just doing this movement scene, right? We're just mm -hmm. exploring back to the town to get back to our flying city. We finally had our fourth player at the table. Sorry, our yep, Alma wasn't joined an, us. Wasn't an NPC. In fact, we got a fifth player because Bob joined us, mm -hmm. and he got an NPC. He got to play Lucky Feather, mm -hmm. the improbably lucky NPC from the first session, at least until we got back to town. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was both a world building moment and a chance for the players to interact and start building connections, uh, both as players at the table and between their characters, to see how the dynamics would play out. Um, which created a, a, a plenty of moments since it is a gamer table for sarcasm and humor, oh, yeah. uh, but also to start fleshing out who these characters are. Well, your two, your rank and file character and John's rank and file character started their new tradition of shit talking the lieutenant, mm -hmm. and then the lieutenant says, "What was that?" And John says, "Nothing, sir." I'm gonna have cards mm -hmm. printed. What was that? Nothing, sir. Because they did it about four or five times during the game. It got to be really quite a lot of fun. We started doing it in other games we're playing uh, as players, even not this campaign. It, it comes <laughs> up. Uh, anytime the three of us are at a table, it's probably going to come up at least once now. Oh, that's hilarious. That's funny. It'll be interesting to see if that shows up in Fiasco when we play Fiasco. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, you guys eventually made it back to the city. There was uh, some role-playing scenes. And the big one was that Bob, our new player, mm -hmm. uh, he got to drop off Lucky Feather and pick up his actual player character and introduce him, who uh, is the lieutenant's cousin, mm -hmm. but he's more of an academic where the lieutenant's more like seeking a life of adventure and glory, and so they don't exactly like each other, which, no. which is nice. You know, it's, it's players should like each other, but I don't think their characters need to like each other. It's a little more interesting narratively if the characters don't all sing Kumbaya, as long as no player feelings get hurt. Yes, but I also like having existing relationships within the characters. Like You introduced me to this idea, it's not just five random people who meet at a bar. Who meet at a bar. Uh, it is instead, you know, how do they know each other? How would they organically come together? The mage, oh, sure, is assigned by the, the military or the government, but then you have cousins or you have shared adventures in the past... Uh, how can you as players build these connections between characters versus them just discovering each other for the first time in your first session? Well, I got that from Fate. I was playing Fate uh, about a year ago, and a friend of mine, John Eister, mentioned that Fate understood one thing that all role players should know. Getting the party together sucks. So therefore, if you can pre-get the party together during character creation, so much the better. Um... I don't do anything as formal as Fate does anymore. I tried doing that, and I found it was just too rigid. Uh, rigid's the wrong word, but too uh, extensive. But I do want every player to be connected to at least one other character from the get-go, whether it's a professional connection or a, uh officer to uh, enlisted men or it's master and servant or it's, you know, even if somebody wants to play the, uh, the, the hireling, and, you know, then, then be the hireling of somebody, you know, be Jeeves to somebody's Wooster. Uh, but some way or other, any way you can connect the party up before the game starts, yes, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference in how you can just get the plot going. I've tried a lot of ham-fisted things over the years to just bring the party together. And uh, this works so much better, to just have some connections before you start. Uh, so they met up, and they did not... Oh, look at this, my note's closed. Uh, they met up, and... Uh, 
turns out that their characters don't particularly like each other, but they do have mutual goals, and, and so that gets things moving. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved into the next adventure, since I, uh, that was sort of wrapping up the first adventure and moving to the second. And so the second, I took all of you hunting mm -hmm. with uh, one of the lieutenant's uh, younger brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, not the player character lieutenant, one of the NPC lieutenants as an NPC younger brother. Slash squire. Yeah, it's a squire. Uh, and uh, so he was the hook for the new adventure. He took you out on it. In fact, it was kind of funny because Bob, our new player, said, I don't want to go on a hunt. That's not a thing my character would be interested in. And then he watched the rest of us play it because in this particular scene, I didn't have an NPC mm -hmm. to give him. And it was funny watching him kind of mope on the side because he didn't know it was going to be a big role-playing scene mm -hmm. that was the adventure. He's like, I, I thought it was just shooting stuff. If there was role-play, I would have been there. You know, and so that, that was a lot of fun, you know. It, it, was, it, was, it was joyful envy, you know. Well, we, we did a flying gondola hunting, uh, razoring birds. Yep. Um, and so you have to have a ranged weapon. You have to be able to hit it. You have to be able to, you know, talk about how you retrieve it on a line. And I had built a character that didn't have anything beyond short range. Right. Uh, so even my character was kind of sitting there as part of the role play, but not part of the, the activity. Um, well, you took a couple of shots at it, right? You just weren't able to catch anything? Maybe you took one with a javelin. I'm not. Oh, that's sure. right. You tried throwing a javelin <laughs> at, at this thing that's about the size of a large dove. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that didn't work out. No, that's so not going to work. Probably wouldn't have worked even if you had hit him. It would have obliterated the poor thing. It was a chance to throw dice. It was a chance to sling some dice, and that's always a good thing. Uh, so he's the, so uh, this squire, he's the plot hook. Mm -hmm. uh, he never wanted to be a squire. He just came out of loyalty to his brother, what he wants to be as an artist. And back in this artist colony on the other side of the Barrier Mountains, which is why I was foreshadowing the Barrier Mountains, is uh, this, uh, art, uh, this artist colony and his mentor has gone missing. So now you guys, being, being stalwart and helpful player characters, plus uh, your lieutenant, the player character, realizes that having somebody owe somebody a favor might do him good in the long run. Because the NPC that, that was the plot hook, his older brother, is another lieutenant in the city guard. And he's well regarded by the populace. Mm -hmm. So there was a social hook there as well as, come on, guys, it's the adventure. Come on, the adventure. Be nice. Um, there's a town in need somewhere. There's a town in need. Save these poor artists from whatever happened. Oh. So, um, so the plot hook is, is laid. The players are on their way. And so all of you check out this same kind of gondola that's used for the hunt mm -hmm. to go flying to uh, across the barrier mountains mm -hmm. to this village where the mentor has gone missing. And I didn't want the players to be bored, so I thought, what better way to do a travel adventure in an adventure RPG than to make things consistently go wrong? Mm -hmm. So first you guys see a new flock of razor wings, mm -hmm. which at first seemed kind of exciting. Except for the fact that they are, we are flying with hot air balloons, and they are called razor wings. Well, there, there's that, there's that. There was some concern. And then there was that really big shadow, mm -hmm. which turned out to be a wyvern hunting. And then it turned out to be two wyverns. And then it turned out to be four. Three. Was oh, it four. three? Four. There were four. One okay. of them you guys chased away immediately. Okay. It, it was like, ah, oh, too much trouble, and, and went mm -hmm. off a different direction. Because really, none of the wyverns wanted to fight. They wanted to eat. Yes. They were hungry as hell, and they were hunting the flock of razor wings. But you guys were in the middle of it because the razor wings went flying right past you. Uh, and uh, so that shredded up the balloon. But it did lead to some pretty exciting fight along the way because mm -hmm. you guys were trying to defend yourselves to chase off this razor wing. And all the time, the balloon is rocking and swaying, and one of the, one of the balloons starts losing air, and then another one gets shredded. And you guys are just barely hanging on. Uh, I think the most exciting moment is when you started to take a tumble. Mm -hmm. Because Josh's character, the lieutenant, is selfish and, and, and arrogant. And his planned character growth arc is that he's going to learn to overcome that and become a better person. And so here he was holding this exquisite crossbow his father had loaned him. And there you are, about to fall off the balloon to your potential death, and he's got to pick which to hold on to. And I know that, you know, heroically speaking, it was an easy call, mm -hmm. but character motivation-wise, he was really conflicted. And then, what, he missed the first roll, so extra drama, mm -hmm. caught you on the second roll, because I made you both roll, and I said whoever's yep. roll was worst 
was the role. That counts. The weakest chain, weakest link, link in the, the chain. chain, right? Then you tried to catch the crossbow with your foot. Or free hand, whatever it was. Yeah. Yes. We, and, we built up this whole scene with me tumbling because I had failed to grab onto the safety line. And then he's trying to catch me. And then I, I miss the barrier. And then he, like, misses my first hand. He gets my second hand. I try and reach out and grab the crossbow so that we can have this perfect moment. Everything's safe. And the dice say no. The dice did say no. Uh, in the meantime, we've got John's character mm -hmm. who did latch onto a safety line. Mm -hmm. And poor thing, he swung under the underside of the gondola. As the gondola has swung this way, and he's banging up against the side of the gondola. Well, he's the only player who ever support. took an action to say, I tie up to a safety line on this sw swinging ship in midair. Right. Uh, that's starting to list. And the rest of us, you know, I'm, I was rushing cross deck to try and grab onto balloon lines mm -hmm. to try and move them to right the ship. And we right. have people firing blasts and bolts at the flying wyverns or at the razor wings. Um, and he's the only one who was smart enough, but then he gets knocked off the ship. But to be fair, when... So the wyvern have this attack that causes knockback. Everybody else got knocked just barely off the ship, and so they had a chance to catch. John's character got knocked two hexes off the ship. There was nothing to catch. His character could well have been dead right there had he not tied it off. And I didn't plan that, but it was delightfully dramatic. And it's really nice when those, those moments happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know how I would have handled it if he hadn't been tied off. I guess I would have given him a chance to try and grab something before he was two hexes out. So at least the dice would give him a chance to save himself. Yeah. I'm not opposed to character death, but I don't I don't seek it. I well, don't we, want characters to die. We previously played in a game where you had each of us players talk about what it would take to kill our characters. Mm -hmm. Would we be okay with death, and in, right. if so, how? Uh, as more of a horror dramatic game. Right. Well, that was because it was a horror game. I knew yeah. I'd be messing with your characters constantly. And in, but in, for me as a player, I don't get necessarily attached to a to a, a character so much that I'm afraid to let it die, mm -hmm. as long as it happens more organically than, oh, the GM decides to hit you with a meteor. Right. Uh, and so in this case, I can't speak for John. If my character had died, then, you know, I wouldn't have been forever heartbroken. I would have been sad that the, you know, I had invested two days, two sessions into a character, but uh, he had planned his own saving. There you go. So it, it worked out beautifully. It worked out good narratively. It worked out to be exciting uh, until eventually the balloon did crash and everybody took a ton of damage. But well, that, less damage than he would have taken free falling. Well, that that was fun though because none of us were tracking the rate of descent of the balloon. But I think you were. I was. Uh, and so we were all distracted players playing distracted characters, and all of a sudden we've hit the ground. Yep. And then to simulate debris, we got out the hex map, and I just threw a ton of dice across the table, mm -hmm. and that was all debris and rocks. One of it landed directly on the hull, mm -hmm. so I ruled that it had punched through the the base of the uh, gondola, so you guys were going to have to fix that. Now, I do have one point before we get into the, the gameplay on the ground. Yeah. When we were in midair, I did have an issue um, because, you know, you talked previously about playing in Theater of the Mind. Right. And everyone designs what they think is happening in their head and everyone mm -hmm. tries to stay on the same page. I'm used to a much more visible interpretation. Yeah, and I've been working on that. I, I don't have a lot of experience using minis on the table, but I'm working on it. So we, we've been trying to use minis, and you've, you've been drawing out maps on a grid pattern, on a uh, laminate. And in this case, we're doing a three-dimensional combat with wyverns going above us, below us, next to us, trying to simulate people being knocked off. And so you had to scramble to show three dimensions on a two-dimensional plane. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering... I think if I were doing it now, what I might have done is to show... So I, was, I had tokens for the wyverns, mm -hmm. right? So what I could have had also was tokens that I slipped under them that indicated elevation. Mm -hmm. So something like uh, two or three tokens means they're way up. Mm -hmm. And if I put a token on top of it, it actually means it's below your plane. Something like that. I've been thinking a little bit about how I would address that in the future. Because I, I see, you know, being a game with a flying city mm -hmm. and flying falcons that the knights of the city ride, I, I'm going to have to deal with three dimensions more than I have thought through. So that's definitely homework for me to go after. Uh, so you guys crashed. We crashed. We had to start um, really for the first time talking about healing, how, the, how that healing works in the Fantasy Age game. 
our healer is throwing out tons of magic points to heal everybody. We're trying to use the heal skill. Uh, it, whether successful or not, there's a limit to how many times an individual player can be healed before they take damage again to reset the balance. Um, and so we're trying to recover ourselves. And then we, I think, do we come under attack right away? Uh, no, actually, the next fight that happened, you guys caused. Oh, we went looking for a fight while still bruised and battered. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, so you went searching the surrounding terrain. You were looking for debris, uh, anything that fell off the uh, ship, like provisions, you know, the barrels of water. You did find the crossbow, although it was pretty banged up, but Josh's lieutenant is planning to repair it or at least get it into working order until he can get it back to some place where it can be properly fixed. And, you know, I, they are going to an artist colony. There might be a craftsman there. I was happy that the dice allowed us to, when I had that moment, like, can I recover his crossbow? Could it could have miraculously fallen within view. I didn't know how fast the our airship was moving. Mm -hmm. The dice said yes. So so that was nice of the dice to do. Yeah. Uh, but or the GM behind the screen. Who knows? Well, you know. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, now, we did run in, however, uh, so Bob also looking around found these tracks for these uh, fire wolves. And uh, Bob's character is a mage, but he's mostly an academic. So he's got lots of lower skills. And he rolled just this amazing roll. He got every piece of information I had recorded because I had it tiered out. Mm -hmm. Based on what you rolled, you'd get this information. And Bob goes, oh, my character sheet says I get another piece of information. I'm like, dude, I'm out. I've got nothing left to tell you. You know everything about these except their genetic structure because nobody knows about DNA yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he got really excited about that because he found out that these firewolves that could spit fire, they did it through this chemical pouch they have in their chest in between their lungs. And he knew that that was a really powerful fuel and very valuable. Mm -hmm. And he comes from a merchant family. So then he goes and convinces John's, uh, not John's, uh, Josh's lieutenant that all of you should go after this. Out of spell points, down to half hit points across the party, first level. Uh, well, he did it through the game mechanic, right? Because that's the, the whole point of Fantasy Age is using the stunt dice. So you have your two regular and your stunt die. Um, and his rolls to heal were so high, and he rolled doubles, that he got stun points. Which, since the game says there's combat versus exploration versus roleplay, he spent his roleplay points uh, convincing the rest of the party to do what he wanted to do. Um, and it worked. And it worked. So you guys tracked these wolves and found out that they have uh, herd tactics. Mm -hmm. they, they communicate in barks and yips like terrestrial wolves do. Mm -hmm. And so they flanked you guys and buried you guys in fire. Uh, except you injured a few of them, and they weren't interested. In, again, they're not interested in you. They're interested in surviving. So they took off. Wait, because you played them more like natural predators versus right. story predators. Yeah, they, they were startled and kill. attacked, so they went after you, but when they saw a chance to escape. But I don't think we, we killed a single one. We simply, You wounded two badly. And they ran off, and they And the ones the that were healthy covered their retreat. Yes. Yeah, and then they took off as soon as the... As soon as the wounded ones were off the map, mm -hmm. the ones that weren't wounded ran that way as well and covered the rear. So yeah, I tried to I tried to play them as a as a protective internally pack, not a group of individuals, mm -hmm. but a, a group that would think as a pack. Uh, so we also this this is also the session where we tested out my new version of how a combat phase works. Mm -hmm. I really latched on to your idea of D and D rounds being six seconds long. So I defined our rounds as six seconds, and then I defined everything you could do in terms of time. So there's minor actions, which take three seconds, and major actions, which take all six, or roughly. Well, you and also, then there are variables. You printed out a sheet for us that made yeah. it easier for me. It didn't change uh, this, how it was done, but it changed how it was visualized. You said that each of these actions, yes, it's a full round action versus a half round action versus a no cost action but you still give each one a value that we could simply add up on the sheet and know, okay, I get two and a half or something. Right. I have this many seconds to do this. Mm -hmm. I also radically rail, reined in uh, movement. Because mm -hmm. in the game, I thought you could just move way too far to make it worth breaking out a map. Mm -hmm. But you really want to use a map because there are a lot of stunts that involve knocking people back or moving them around. And theater of the mind doesn't utilize that well. You need a map for that to really sing. 
So, but well, when you rolled the dice uh, to simulate boulders and cover on the field, we were able to move around those with our minis, right? Uh, and that way we could see line of sight and we could see, oh, I, you know, was hiding or I knocked a creature back into mm -hmm. a, a structure or a wall, uh, and that makes it easier for us to play with the environment. That good. I'm glad because that was the goal. Mm -hmm. That was entirely the goal was to uh, put a little bit more in front of you guys. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, when I used to play Theater of the Mind a whole lot, it was with people who similarly felt like, well, if they needed there to be a ledge there for them to knock the bad guy off of, they just said there was a ledge there. And unless there was some specific reason for it to not be there that made me overrule them, well, there's a ledge there and you knocked him over. You know, So that's how I was used to in Theater of the Mind. But I am trying to find some hybrid where you guys have enough environmental information that you do see things you can take hold of or take advantage of. Anyway, the new uh, combat round rules are going to be, there's going to be a link down in the doobly-doo to those rules, and so you'll be able to read those whenever you want. Um, so uh, you guys made it back to the camp and settled in for a rest, and you wanted to go ahead and do all your nights of healing, but I vetoed that because I'm not sure I'm going to let you guys have a quiet night, mm -hmm. but that's where we paused our second session. Our heroes are up in the barrier mountains trying to get to the eastern side and hoping they make it through the night. We'll see if any survive. We'll see if any survive. Well, our next session is going to be in just a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. so I'm pretty excited about that. And I've rewritten a bunch based on what you guys have done so far. I've tried to think more about where you're going. So we'll see if I do well. Uh, he'll let us know if I do well. And if we do really badly, then maybe he won't be in the next episode. Uh, we'll see. The character uh, doesn't survive, the player doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and, and we still, there's just the two of us right now, but we are, we're going to convince some of the other people at the table to come join us for a few vids, and so we'll talk about those. And in the meantime, you keep watching, and we'll be back soon.